For a long time here in the West, we've had the freedom to move just about anywhere we wanted to. Well, we still have that freedom, but as we see more and more droughts, heat waves and wildfires throughout Europe, North America and other parts of the world, we become more aware of questions that people in other parts of the world and throughout history have been very aware of. Will a given place have enough water for people to drink and for crops to grow? For a long time we've had the possibility to ignore these basic questions because cheap abundant energy allowed us to build cities in the desert, irrigate gardens for merely aesthetic purposes and so on. But concerns about drinking and growing crops are only the most obvious problems related with prolonged periods of dryness. As the groundwater level decreases over years, the soil contracts and even rugged buildings from concrete and stone will get cracks. Extreme heat will also lead to damaged roads and railways, and I'm sure this as well is not the end of that story. It is time that we demand from our representatives to truly ruggedize the systems we all rely on. But even if they were to act now, you and me as individuals should still also act ourselves, because in many regards that outside help will be too little, too late. All I'm saying is, try to be independent, try to build independent systems, and redundancies. In that sense, I hope that I will find some quality stuff on the scrap today that might help me to build some of those systems and be at very small ones. What do we have here then? This heavy machine is a lost cause, but it still has a bunch of electronic components that we can salvage. For one of today's projects I will also need a bunch of thick metal sheets and that's why I will buy some of this steel. This blue enclosure looks pretty new and I'm sure there are some valuable components inside. Inside this container I also found a Gardena pump I would have good use for. In addition to those smaller items I also got my hands on this trailer that we will completely rebuild and modify in this episode. Let's get going then. Let's have a look at these parts then. They are all contactors, with the addition that some of them are coupled with overload relays for motor protection. Some of the components like this one were physically damaged at the scrapyard though. In the case of this contactor the upper damaged part is a module though that can be detached from the actual contactor and then another module from another severely damaged unit can be connected instead. Since some of these parts were broken anyway we might as well take them apart and see how they work. This little module really only consists of an additional set of contacts and little plastic push rods that are mechanically coupled to the electromagnet of the actual contactor. And since one of those was also broken, we can have a look inside there as well. As you can see, we basically have two iron cores made from transformer lamination that are being pulled together when the coil is energized. And here we can see the contacts of that coil. These contactors are available for different coil voltages for both DC and AC. This one has a 230 volt AC coil. It can thus be activated using the mains voltage directly. Also related to this topic is what we find inside the big blue enclosure that I brought home from the scrapyard as well. I want to salvage the components and reuse the enclosure for a future project and that's why I removed the old stickers using the steam cleaner. Inside we find an on-off switch for three-phase power, a three-phase contactor, an RCD and circuit breakers, then three very special and much more expensive parts from left to right, a three-phase soft starter, a meter and energy analyzer, and a three-phase monitoring relay. Down here we also have surge protectors. Behind the door there are two PCBs and this is basically a control and switchboard for a small combined heat and power unit in German Blockheizkraftwerk. The idea is basically to use some form of fossil energy like natural gas or diesel but instead of just burning it you use it to run an engine to power an electric generator and you also use the excess heat for heating your home. 
Well, and something like that is of course quite expensive and just the rail mounted components in here, not counting the control unit, would cost you in excess of 1,500 euros, well, if you would buy them new. Kind of insane that this ended up on the trash after not even 10 years. The components all seem to work as well. I've managed to reset this meter and it has seen quite a few kilowatt hours. A new one is 250 euros. This soft starter allows you to, well, soft start a three-phase induction motor. The current price seems to be more than twice that of the meter. And this monitoring relay can take two RMS measurements, among other things, of the voltages and also the frequency of all three phases separately. Pretty cool components and I'm sure I will reuse those sooner or later. The enclosure will also serve a new purpose and I removed most of the components. I'm also closing that hole with a piece of aluminium that I simply glue on it to close it. It's only a matter of time until these parts will reappear in a future video. Let us take care of this trailer then. I saw it pop up online for a very low price and drove here to check it out. The fact that it has graffiti on it probably doesn't help the seller in finding a buyer, but unfortunately you will find these tags on almost any trailer or camper that has been sitting for a little too long at the same spot. That's just what it's like to live in a big city these days. Looking at it from underneath we can see an extremely old fashioned and simple construction style. The suspension simply consists of two thick leaf springs. This trailer was made in 1976 and this is certainly a big difference to what a more modern trailer looks like as you can see in this footage here. One advantage of the more modern style is that shock absorbers can be installed here and you can then get permission to drive it at 100 km per hour instead of just 80. Back underneath the old fashioned trailer though we can see that the wooden floor also has some water damage and that the lights have been renewed and wired in a rather dodgy way. On the opposite side we have at least no graffiti. But probably worse the trailer has been patched up with this rusty steel sheet here. I knew that this would be a lot of work but I couldn't resist so I bought the trailer and brought it to the workshop. Part of the deal was a big pile of heavy copper cable scrap that came with the trailer. I was able to sell the scrap for almost 200 euros and that's why you could argue that I got the trailer essentially for free. Looking inside I can tell what happened here in the past though. See I don't know how it is in other countries but here in Germany pickup trucks are rather rare. Many people in rural areas own a trailer though and the most common type is the open 750 kg trailer without brakes. There are also ones for heavier cargo but they come with brakes and often two axles. They are built more ruggedly but are also more expensive. Much fancier than an open trailer is a closed one. It can be used as a storage unit, protect your stuff from wind, weather and of course theft and I guess that even more and more people occasionally use these for camping and road trips. But while a small open style trailer is maybe only a few hundred bucks, a closed style trailer can easily cost you 3000 euros. So what happened here is that someone converted an open 750 kg trailer into a closed model. The back doors are missing but the conversion is legal and there is an entry about that in the trailer's paperwork. I have some rather big plans here and I want to make some modifications myself. But first we have to take a closer look and do some rather substantial repair work. When I started to work on this trailer I did already suspect that I would only find the full extent of potential corrosion damage by digging a little deeper. But I still started by taking care of the most obvious problems. I used a wire wheel to remove rust and damaged paint in some spots that you could see right away. This steel sheet was screwed to the trailer with self-tapping screws in order to close a hole that someone had once cut into the front wall of the trailer. 
I think this happened because someone wanted to haul a big motorcycle or something even longer that wouldn't have fit inside otherwise. I was planning to remove that steel sheet from the beginning, but still decided to remove the rust first because I was already determined to reuse the sheet to repair this hole in a more professional way. I removed the screws and to my amazement I found even more sheets underneath. These aluminium sheets were riveted to the original steel wall. A former owner applied the just slap more stuff onto it philosophy of repair. These original sheets had some rather extreme damage. The original sheets had some rather severe damage and I decided to cut everything away that had holes or pitting. Apart from the drawbar and frame that connects axle and trailer hitch, this vehicle only consists of wood and bent steel sheets. And at least here in the front, the part where the sheets connect to the drawbar is in a disastrous state. At this point, I still believed that this kind of damage would maybe be limited to the section that had been covered by the rusty sheet, so I made preparations to do limited repair work in this spot only. Instead of relying on sheet metal only, I used a rather heavy steel tube here. The somewhat rotten outer edge of that wooden panel was removed and the old paint was ground off in those parts where I was planning to weld or apply new paint. After cutting it to the correct length, the tube was bolted to the drawbar and the formerly rusty sheet was cut and bent to cover the gaping hole in the trailer wall before it was welded onto it. While removing some of the old paint, I realized though that the sheet metal might be in much worse shape overall than I had originally hoped. So we decided to remove the entire box and floor panels to dig deeper and see if more substantial measures would be in order. This is the kind of work that is very hard to do all by yourself, so I was happy to have a buddy help out with some aspects of this project. With the plywood panels removed, we also unscrewed the bolts that held the inner steel frame of that box and lifted it out of the trailer. To my surprise, the former owner had also slapped on more material here than I thought. These are super heavy 8mm aluminium sheets. I decided to use paint stripper to remove old paint from them. I won't reuse them in this project, but I will put them in storage for future endeavors. Aluminium plates of that strength and size would be 200 euros now if bought new. And with the plywood panels also gone, the true extent of the damage became visible and this only held up its promise of truly having the power to surprise. At this point, a more reasonable man might say, cut your losses and move on, or in other words, give up this project, sell the scrap metal and work on something else instead. But I can be very stubborn like that. So I proceeded to cut off all rusty parts and build a steel frame from heavy steel angle pieces that would carry the weight of the cargo in the future, with the old sheet metal merely acting as sidewalls of the trailer but not really adding much to the structural integrity of it. So I placed these stock parts on the bent sheets to take the correct measurements so that these parts would fit together. I welded that frame and then fastened it onto the drawbar and axle and lifted the old container onto it, before I then welded the sheets to that new support. These angled steel pieces were also welded to that frame and this is where the box that closes the trailer will be attached directly. Since the old phenolic panels were too rotten, I decided to use these rather thick metal sheets from the scrapyard to rebuild the floor. We cut these individual parts to the correct length so that they would fit inside. But of course that floor would still need additional supports so I welded T and L shaped steel pieces into the frame at the exact positions needed to support neighboring pieces of sheet metal. The steel sheets were then welded to the frame and to each other. 
After tilting the trailer to its side and preparing the old and new parts of the trailer's frame with wire wheeling and degreaser, we then painted everything with several layers of paint. And at this point, the bottom is the most beautiful part of this vehicle. In the next step, the frame for the box is reattached and here is where the first major modification starts. I have increased the height of the box by around 30 centimeters so that I will be able to stand upright inside the trailer. I explain later why I want to do that. In the meantime, I had already reattached the wooden walls and top of the trailer. But since I had increased its height, there is a big gap, of course, and I intend to close that gap with even more of those steel sheets from the scrap. After cutting them to the right length, they were welded to the top of those bent sheets and step by step I'm closing the gaps on all three sides. After that I paint everything quickly since even a little bit of rain will be enough for these degreased pieces to start rusting again. While I'm waiting for the paint to dry, we can take care of the lights. This part here was used to hold the license plate, lights and stabilize the floor under the door of the trailer. But I removed it because it is bent out of shape. I will instead use this L-shaped piece of scrap. I remove the rust, drill a bunch of holes, bolt it to the trailer and paint it with the same paint. In the meantime I also prepare the lights that I equip with new wires, connectors, heat shrink, etc. The next thing that I wanted to take care of was the surface of these panels. It would be nice to get those stickers off the phenolic panels and I tried everything from hot air and steam to aggressive chemicals, but it just takes too much time. So I ended up removing only what I could get off. The rest of those stickers is welded to the surface in such a fashion that I might as well just leave it on there. In order to protect the box from rain, I then applied MS polymer to the panels and now I'm gluing this waterproof tarp over the surfaces. On top of that, I used the old aluminum extrusions that came with the trailer to also fasten those tarps from the outside. The tarps are not older than maybe a year, but have some stains because rusty parts were sitting on them. I had to be a little creative to cover the entire surface with what I had, but I didn't want to spend any more money on new materials for this project. And this is the point, by the way, where I decided to drive the trailer to the general inspection, which almost every vehicle, not just cars, but also trailers, have to go through every two years in Germany. And the trailer is now officially roadworthy again. And there are a lot of smaller miscellaneous things that I also already took care of, like painting the trailer from the inside, painting the wheel arches, closing every possible hole gap seam on the walls and on the top with MS polymer and so on. But there are actually some bigger things that I still wanted to do and one of them was to close the trailer with a door. And well, the former owner had these phenolic panels that he sometimes just loosely attached to the backside of the trailer, but he never really managed to actually use them as proper doors. So I changed that by buying a couple of hinges and screwing these panels uh, to the back side. And then I used two latches to fasten one door to the trailer and then two bigger latches on the outside on the second door to actually, well, close the doors and lock them with padlocks. But one other thing that I also saw is that the area of the top of the trailer is just big enough to hold three of the 100 watt solar panels that I have in storage. So I decided to install them here as well. What am I actually planning to do with that? Well, I have two ideas and couldn't really decide yet, but I will follow up on this with another video in which I will show how I do that. And well, let me ask you, what would you do with a trailer like that and potentially with a couple of solar panels on top?
I also found this Gardena pump at the scrapyard. It might well be 20 years old, but apart from the stained plastics it's still looking pretty good and we'll just have to find out if it still works. In order to buy some hoses that would fit a pump like this, I drove to a local hardware store where Gardena is offering some of their more recent models. I think in the aftermath of the floods that we had last year in some parts of the country, they also are advertising here that their pumps can be used in cases of emergencies. But I also see a few problems here. One is that the new pumps have a lot of plastic parts, even the threads where you will attach the brass connectors of the hose are made from plastic and we can wonder how many times you can use those before they wear out or break. But what they lack in stainless steel, they thought they made up with more electronics, like adding displays and connecting the pumps to your smartphone. Didn't they just advertise their pumps for use in emergencies? I can only speak for myself, but I want a pump to do one job and one job only, and that is to pump water reliably. Especially if you have ever been in a flood, you will understand that you need things to just work. Last year local floods also knocked out parts of the power grid and then your local mobile phone servers will also collapse. Good luck downloading the app then. But independent of emergency scenarios, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that this particular model is just not made for that type of scenario. One thing I have learned by now is that apps and software in general can have a very short lifespan. And the manufacturer might just not provide up-to-date software anymore for the models they made a few years before. It's just my opinion, but I think that as we see one crisis after another, we need all systems to be as reliable as possible and we are constantly going in the wrong direction. Unfortunately, it seems like we will have to do that ourselves, since all kinds of companies are adding more complexity all the time. While I'm here, I'm also looking for a new, bigger rain barrel, because many of the plants in my garden almost died in the most recent heat wave. It's time to store more rainwater for ever more frequent droughts and quasi droughts. Back home, I'm connecting the hoses to the pump and it does indeed work. But big surprise, the electronic module that is made from plastic is the part that is leaking. But Good that back in the day Gardena made it easy to simply remove the plastic part from the actual pump and use it just on itself. And its first job is now to pump the remaining rainwater out of the old water barrel into these tubs here. And after I have placed the new barrel in that spot, it can pump the water in there and the pump still does what it was made for. So guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if that was the case, please give this video a like to let me know that I should make more of them. And if you want to support the production of new episodes, you can also donate via PayPal, a link is down in the video description, or become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.